Well, welcome everyone uh, to this session, which is on uh, Lenin, State and Revolution. Um, our speaker for this session is Sue Caldwell, who's uh, a teacher and a leading um, member of the Socialist Workers' Party. Okay, thanks very much. So, um, I want to start off just talking a little bit about, um, just, just very briefly, um, about Lenin uh, as being the what Trotsky referred to as the author of the Russian Revolution, the leader of the Bolshevik Party, who um, uh, forged the, the Bolshevik Party and uh, uh, theoretically armed it for uh, intervening in the revolutionary struggle to place the uh, working class in power in uh, October in 1917 through the uh, organization of the Soviets, the Workers' Councils, and through the slogan, uh, Bread, Land and Peace, all power to the Soviets. And uh, as a result of that role, historic role that Lenin played, he has been vilified um, uh, not only throughout his life, but also, you know, you often find that a lot of people who are vilified throughout their lives, suddenly everybody decides they're really nice once they're dead. But to the ruling class, it's very important to continue to this day to vilify Lenin because he was the person that really, through the Bolshevik Party and his leadership of the Bolshevik Party, represented a fundamental challenge to the whole way in which society is organized. The principles of capitalism, of parliamentary democracy, of this being the way the world is, and so on, was fundamentally challenged, and a whole different way of running society was posed through what the but what uh, Lenin and the uh, uh, and the Bolsheviks did and so you find him vilified not only by the ruling class but also by huge sections of the left for whom the best they can think of when it comes to a different way of organizing society is really that we put a different set of people into parliament than the current set of people we've got now, people with a different set of principles, but who fundamentally do not uh, uh, want to change the whole way I I in which society runs, or at least um, do not have an understanding of how that change could come about. And it's important for them as well to distance themselves from Lenin and to try to, uh, uh, to say that Lenin represented something that he really didn't. The most common narrative which you will come across is that Lenin was a would-be dictator, that he organized a small minority of people in the Bolshevik to stage a coup, that through this di dictatorial um, strategy, it was inevitable that somebody like Stalin could just pick up the reins and follow on where he left off, and that there was a smooth and seamless transition between Lenin and Stalin. And uh, all manner of uh, academic study devoted to the Russian Revolution that you will come across will feed you one version or another of that, um, of that narrative. And one of the things about studying the state and revolution, and the reason this meeting is called Lenin and State and Revolution, is because one of the most important uh, books that Lenin wrote was uh, this little pamphlet called The State and Revolution. And I do thoroughly recommend that anybody who hasn't read it to buy it and read it, and anybody who last read it quite a long time ago, like myself, to read it again, because it really does, is a fantastic text to go back and reread. Not only does it seem fresh and relevant for today, but it is enormously clear on what the tasks uh, on, uh, on, 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 on what the tasks presenting the revolution are. And one of the things that really comes through um, uh, as you're reading it is the enormous faith in the ability of the masses of ordinary workers to run society for themselves. That enormous faith that you don't find in so many other places who say, elect us, we'll run it for you. Uh, you need people who know better than you, who are better educated than you, who are more experienced than you to tell you what to do. You need the experts to do this, that and the other. And what comes through uh, with reading, with reading uh, Lenin is his, his deep ability, and um, his deep belief in ordinary workers to be able to run society, um, to be able to run society for themselves. And it's utter disdain for people who want to limit that creative potential of the working class and want to limit the achievements that workers can actually achieve when they, um, uh, uh, um, when they fight back. So state and revolution really was started 
um, really as a polemic against the reformists. I'll just explain a little bit about what I mean by the reformists. I mean people who believe that you could take over the ready-made uh, 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 machineries of state in various forms, in particular the parliament which through which you could then run things like <laughs> the army, the police and so on and so forth and that through that you could gradually transform capitalist society into a fairer society. Now the people who um, uh, ended up following this path actually would call themselves quite often Marxists. They would call themselves uh, uh, they, they would call themselves followers of Marx, even they would call themselves revolutionaries. Um, the, the, the people that Lenin had his sharpest um, polemic with were the uh, uh, people organised in the German Social Democratic Party, and at the time Social Democratic was a, was a phrase associated with revolutionary organisations. Uh, a man called Karl Kautsky, who professed himself to be um, a follower of um, a follower of Marx, and in the course of the Russian Revolution that started with the overthrow of the Tsar in February 1917, and uh, and its replacement by a provisional government and a period of dual power where workers' councils were also uh, 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 operating, through to the uh, uh, um, transfer of power to the workers' councils. Uh, uh, with the Bolshevik Party um, at its head. Throughout that period, Lenin was battling against people who were influenced by that idea that we didn't, that, that we could somehow, uh, once we'd got this parliamentary democracy, that really was the way forward and we could take control of that parliament and through that parliament we can, uh, um, <coughs> we can control society. So, so uh, Lenin started uh, writing it, and it was actually published during, um, I think, July, August 1917. So, in other words, as the revolutionary process was unfolding, uh, this 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 work came out. And in order to really take on the arguments, because they were coming from people who called themselves Marxists, um, what Lenin decided to do was to go back and look at what Marx and Engels actually wrote about the state in order to expose the way in which these people who were following this reformist path, um, actually were deviating completely from the revolutionary essence of what Karl Marx, um, of what Karl Marx actually said. And that was what he, um, and, and, and that was what he set, him, set himself out to do uh, in the state and revolution. And I'm going to just kind of summarise the contradictions, the, the uh, differences in the two positions by reading you a quote that actually comes from a pamphlet that Lenin wrote a little bit later in 19... Um, uh, 22, but it, I think it nicely sums up the differences between the two approaches to how do you fundamentally change society in the interests of the working class. And so uh, Lenin writes this, he said, um, Marx says, quote, uh, between capitalist and communist society there lies the period of the revolutionary transformation of the one into the other. Corresponding to this is a period of political transition in which the state can be nothing but the revolutionary dictatorship of the proletariat. That's Marx's position. Uh, and then he says, given our experiences over the last... Uh, sorry, he's, 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 um, he's quoting... Lenin is quoting from... Um, this is a quote from Kautsky. Um, so this is what Kautsky says. Given our experiences over the last few years, we can now alter this passage on the kind of government we want and say, quote... Between the period of a purely bourgeois state and a purely proletarian state, there lies a period of the transformation of one into the other. Corresponding to this, there is also a period of political transition in which the state will usually take the form of a coalition government. So you can see the complete difference that when Marx <coughs> talked about how do you transition from, from, from capitalism to communism, you need the revolutionary dictatorship of the proletariat. In other words, you need to take on the question of the state and, 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 and move and, and, and get rid of a state that, uh, 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 that operates in the interest of the, of the ruling class and replace it with a state that operates in the uh, 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 ruling class minority and replace it with a state that operates in the interest of the working class majority. Um, by contrast, uh, the idea that if we have some kind of government, that slowly we can, trans we can transform uh, 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 capitalism into, uh, into, into communism. So, so to take on this, um, uh, this kind of attitude, uh, Lenin went back to uh, Marx and Engels' writings um, on the state. And he, talked to, he, he started, actually, 
by looking at angles. Now, when we in the SWP talk about angles, we often talk about um, the classic book that he wrote, The Origins of the Family, Private Property and the State. And we often do that in the context of talking about explaining women's, where women's oppression came from with the rise of class society. But it's important to remember the and the state bit on that as well. Because the development and the, uh, 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 the split of society into classes is crucial uh, 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 for the development of the state as well. So Engels says, the state is a product of society at a certain stage in development. It is the admission that this society has become entangled in an insoluble contradiction with itself. That it has split into irreconcilable opposites, which it is powerless to, uh, powerless to conjure away. In other words, the existence of a state is an expression of the irreconcilability of classes. And because of two classes, with irreconcilable interests acting in opposition to each other, it's necessary to have some kind of power which seemingly stands above the classes and imposes an order on society. And Lenin uh, deliberately puts the word order in inverted commas. And later, when he talks about the dictatorship of the proletariat and the transition to communism, he gets rid of the inverted commas because he said this is really what order in society should look like, whereas the order that you get Within, uh, uh, within a capitalist society actually means the continuing uh, exploitation of, uh, uh, of the working class by the, um, by the, by, 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 by the, by the ruling class. Um, so, um, so, so whereas for Marx and Engels, the uh, state was the expression of the irreconcilability of classes, for the reformists, the, uh, you know, and this would apply to uh, people in, in, in the Labour Party today and parties like that um, um, uh, um, around the world, uh, uh, Syriza and so on, that for the reformists, the state is an organ, organ for the reconciliation of classes. In other words, by using the state, we will somehow uh, stop its excesses stop this, the horrible things that it does to working class people. Use the state to look after working class people uh, uh, um, better. Whereas what Lenin re uh, uh, um, uh, re reiterated was that what Marx said was that if it was possible to reconcile the classes, then actually you wouldn't need, um, you wouldn't need a state in the first place because the state is an instrument of class uh, rule. It's <coughs> there for the suppression of one class by another. And Lenin asked what um, uh, uh, power does that state consist in? How does it exercise this power? And there's a famous passage where he talks about the, uh, 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 the state <coughs> consisting in uh, what he called special bodies of armed men. And of course in his day it would even more be men um, than, it, uh, than it, 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 it would be now, who have um, prisons, etc at their disposal. In other words, armed bodies of force, the judiciary, the army, the police force, uh, uh, and so on. Um, and he also talks about this being backed up by a whole uh, bureaucratic state apparatus, not just through the civil service, but also through the, the um, uh, bureaucratic apparatuses of, um, uh, of parliament and so on. And he talks about this state, this combination of the bureaucratic state apparatus and the uh, 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 and, the, and the organs of force through the standing army being perfected by the ruling class as the ruling class emerged from a series of bourgeois revolutions of fights against um, uh, monarchies and uh, feudal aristocracies and so on and in a whole series of class struggle perfecting these organs of the state as an instrument of, um, uh, as an instrument of uh, class rule. Um, and it's interesting when you read through some of that stuff about how uh, modern some of the uh, some of the writings feel because remember he's you know he's putting this out in the midst of a revolutionary situation where you've overthrown the Tsar and you have a provisional government and a whole number of people who call themselves revolutionary Marxists they can belong to I mean one of the organizations was called was, was the Mensheviks which was a split in the Russian Social Democratic Party from which the Bolsheviks emerged the word Bolshevik just means majority because they won the particular argument over that split about the nature um, of the party but the Mensheviks who came you know allegedly from this revolutionary Marxist tradition people who called themselves socialist revolutionaries that was the name of their party so you'd think oh they must be pretty revolutionary, but leaders of these parties going into the parliament and then going, oh, well, actually, this is quite good. We've got this parliament now. 
Uh, maybe we should just calm down a little bit. Maybe we should start to think about how we can start uh, to, within these organ organs, uh, uh, um, organize um, society. Uh, and that was both inside the Soviets as they were and inside the, inside the provisional government. It was a long argument with the Bolsheviks inside the Soviets to get leadership of them and to argue that actually we needed to completely smash this state. And there's an interesting little piece here where he writes some... Um, in the government itself, a sort of permanent quadrille, the quadrille is a kind of dance, um, a sort of permanent quadrille is going on in order that, on the one hand, as many socialist revolutionaries and Mensheviks as possible may in turn get near the pie, the lucrative and honourable posts, and that, on the other hand, the attention of the people may be engaged. Meanwhile, it is in the chancelleries and general staffs that they do the business of the state. So, in other words, he's talking about already in this just now newly developing um, parliamentary democracy, the way in which that whole idea of the careerist politician, of people who suddenly start to think, oh, maybe I can, you know, you can see some of these Labour MPs, can't you? You know, oh, maybe if I stick the knife into Corbyn now, maybe I can get myself a nice little job in the future. You know, maybe things will be quite cosy for me making that kind of decision with themselves. You know, and all this stuff now about that you hear now why do people like Corbyn so much because he's precisely not like that you know they don't see him as somebody who just sits chattering away in parliament where the real business the things that really matter in the outside world are happening in the banks in big business uh, uh, in the courts uh, 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 being decided by the police being decided by the generals which actually parliament has very very little control over whatsoever but they sit there chattering amongst themselves convincing themselves they're really important trying to get all these nice uh, jobs. There's a phrase that he uses about um, people getting com comparatively comfortable, quiet, and respectable jobs, raising their heads above the um, 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 above the people. I will talk a little bit later on about that whole thing about the uh, uh, the idea of parliamentary democracy and how democratic it is and what um, uh, um, uh, what real democracy um, might look like. And he really aims his fire at the reformists for saying that this is the best that they can get is to have an elected parliament and use the state and so on. But of course it's not just uh, through, the, uh, through those offices that the state um, operates. It's, it's also through uh, the standing army, the prisons, the judges and so on and so forth. And anybody who was at the opening rally on Thursday and listened to the stories of the way in which the South Yorkshire police behaved in a whole number of different situations. I mean, wasn't it astonishing the connection, you know, from Orgreave to Hillsborough to the Rotherham 12? You know, you can really see the way in which that question of the forces of the state, the real force of the state, because you know, uh, 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 um, you know, Lenin and Marx and Engels talked about the, 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 the state operating both at the level of, of physical force, but also through, um, um, uh, also through the level of ideas and consent and that whole idea that, you know, you've got to vote now, you're okay really, you know, this is how you can control and have a say in society. But when it needs be, that physical force will come out. I mean, I don't know how many people remember, I actually can't remember the name or whether the name was ever made public, but the general that said, when Corbyn was elected leader of the Labour Party, and they thought that he might um, stand up and get rid of Trident, you know, unfortunately, that was a pressure that he that 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 he didn't resist. Unfortunately, maybe if things change in the future, that might change. But um, you know, do you remember the general who said, "Well, if that happens, we're going to we're we're we're, uh, we're not going to obey that. We're going to mutiny." You know, and nobody went, "Oh, this is terrible." The general was talking about mutiny. It's just kind of accepted that the general has a right to say this. You know, there's something about um, you know the army as being one of those institutions of, uh, being one of those uh, key institutions of, um, uh, uh, of, 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 state, of state power. And an another thing that Lenin talks about is he talks about how as the revolution goes through different stages that um, workers start to see through some of the things that uh, their reformist leaders were saying to them. Um, and he talked about how, you know, you can replace one lot of leaders and you, you, you get these people in power, the provisional government and so on, and people start to see through it. And therefore, workers start to take more radical measures to take matters into their own hands. And the more they do that, the more the repressive power of the state comes down on them. And as I was reading it, it kind of made me think about Egypt, you know, about how when they came out into the squares and they got rid of Mubarak, and then they had the election and they got... Um, Morsi, yeah, um, and then and then and then Morsi didn't deliver, did he? 
you know, and people started to get disillusioned. Do you remember they had those mass protests against Morsi? But actually, what was the outcome of that? Was the, was the repressive power of the state, was the army coming to centre stage? And, and since then, we've seen mass repression. And we've seen not only the, uh, the uh, people in the Muslim, bro Muslim Brotherhood being um, viciously beaten, locked up, murdered, tortured and so on, but also that same treatment being meted out to the revolutionary socialist uh, uh, leaders and groups um, inside Egypt. So that idea that really the closer that, that, that people get to beginning to see through the way in which society really operates and what really needs to be done in order to fundamentally change society, that that brutal state apparatus um, gets mobilised uh, gets mobilised in defence of, um, of the ruling class. You know, it really rings um, so true. It really rings um, so true for today. So, um, so, so what's the solution then? There kind of has to be a way forward for this because otherwise we get left with the choice between either our reformist leaders, our leaders get bought off and they get sucked into you know, this idea that we can just run the system and get a few nice cushy jobs for ourselves or uh, we become radical and then they turn the army on us and we all get smashed and tortured and beaten up. So neither of those are really very nice <coughs> alternatives. So there has to be some kind of solution to that. Now, when Marx talked about that, one of the, one of the things that Marx did after analysing the state, and, and, and he thought this was so important that he went back and made an addition to the Communist Manifesto for, a next, for, for its next edition to include this in it. Because he learned, not from the fact that he simply sat in an ivory tower and thought, hmm, wonder about the state, wonder what a different sort of state might be, what could we do? But he actually looked at what the workers in the Paris Commune did in 1871. And he learned from what the workers in the Paris Commune did in 1871, because the workers there rose up and in the process of rising up, they started to form their own governments. This is where this word commune came from. And they had various um, decrees that they put into place for running Paris in a different kind of way. And one of the first things that they did was that they abolished the standing army and they replaced it with the armed working class. But they also did a number of other things. They, where they elected officials to positions to represent them in committees, they said a number of things have to happen with these officials. Number one, they have to not get paid more than the average wage of the workers that they represent. Number two, they have to be instantly recallable. How fantastic to be able to do that with the people that you represent. I wonder how long Angela Eagle would last if she was instantly recallable by her constituency for her actions. And so this is, the, what, uh, this is what began to happen, that workers organised themselves around the areas in which they worked and lived, but they did it in ways that meant that they could have direct control over the people that they elected to represent them. Not only that, but they also talked about the, uh, the, the commune being um, a working, not a legislative body. So it wasn't just a body that passed laws and then left it up to somebody else to go out and implement those laws. It was, in other words, it wasn't a talking shop. It had to be a doing shop. It had to be the people, the, the, the people who were directly electable by uh, the working class and accountable to the working class also had to be the people that went out and actually physically implemented the results of what they had decided to do. So it was no good sitting and chatting about something and then thinking, well, never mind, we'll leave that for another six months. And they didn't actually have six months in the end. It was a very short-lived experiment. And one of the lessons that Marx drew from that was that um, through these uh, much more democratic methods of organising, the workers could begin to pose a counter, a different sort of state to the one that had previously existed. And the lesson that he drew from it was ultimately um, defeated. And the lesson that he drew from that was uh, that he said, um, uh, one thing especially is proved by the, com by the communards, viz. That the working class cannot simply lay hold of the ready-made state and, and wield it for its own purposes. And he talked about how the bureaucratic military machine had to be smashed and he said this is the preliminary condition for uh, every real people's uh, for every real people's revolution. 
And Lenin, when he talks about that in State and Revolution, talks about how that really revolutionary core of Marxism is what is absolutely forgotten and missed and glossed over, he says, um, by people who claim to be in the Marxist tradition but aren't themselves truly revolutionary. And if you study academic Marxism, this bit of Marxism will be something that isn't really emphasised. They might go, oh, Marx, yeah, he was quite good at analysing how capitalism worked, and he had some quite good things to say about this, that, and the other, but let's just keep quiet about the, the bit where he says that you've got to smash the bourgeois state and replace it with the revolutionary dictatorship of the proletariat. In other words, rip the revolutionary guts out of what Marx, um, um, what Marx uh, actually... Um, of what Marx actually actually said. So the Commune replaced the standing army with the armed people, um, uh, um, uh, directly elected workers on workers' wage, wages, directly recallable, a working, not a legislative body, not a talking shop. Um, and Lenin says this, he says, thus, thus the Commune appears to have replaced the smashed state machine only and he puts this in inverted commas, it's been a bit ironic there, only by further democracy. The abolition of the, of the standing army, all, all um, officials to be elected and subject to recall, uh, 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 recall and so on. In other words, what he's arguing is that the dictatorship of the proletariat, you know, people hear this word dictatorship and you think, oh, that must be something that's imposed by a tiny group of people on everybody else. The dictatorship of the proletariat is actually a much fuller um, democracy than bourgeois um, parliamentary, uh, than bourgeois parliamentary democracy. Um, and I just want to uh, come back to um, another quote about um, bourgeois democracy. Um, this is, this is Lenin again, but this is a slightly different book. This is, this is him quoting from another book where he's arguing against Kautsky again. Um, Bourgeois democracy, although a great historical advance in comparison with medievalism, always remains and under capitalism is bound to remain restricted, truncated, false and hypocritical, a paradise for the rich and a snare and deception for the exploited, for the poor. Deceit, violence, corruption, mendacity, hypocrisy and oppression of the poor is hidden beneath the civilised, polished and perfumed exterior of modern bourgeois democracy. What a brilliant description of what actually happens in Parliament. The perfumed area of Parliament where they all sit around and chatter, and what actually happens is they're passing these laws that restrict us, you know, that ruin our lives, and so on and so on and so forth. And so he counters um, this uh, democratic dictatorship of the proletariat to um, 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 to, uh, to 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 that to that democracy. Um, okay, so. Uh, and, and, and there's all, and, and you know, when you think about things like the Panama Papers, the Chilcot Report, how long has the Chilcot Report taken to blooming right, for heaven's sake? And how many million words is it? It's not something that's designed for workers to react to immediately, is it? It's like several million words long or something. Who's going to have time to read that when you've got to go to work every day? You know, the, the, the deceit and the hypocrisy and all the rest of it, the way that the whole thing really, really stinks, I think that just so rings true, to, uh, rings true today. Um, so Lenin's further contribution was to talk about, and, 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 and you know, and Lenin made a contribution not only in clarifying the ideas of Marx and Engels, but actually on the question of the state in order to smash that idea that that bourgeois democracy was the best that we could hope for. But he also um, talked about um, the means by which that can, the vehicle through which that can happen, because he was engaged in that process himself through um, the October Revolution, and that's where he talked about the role of the workers' councils, the role of the Soviets, and that's why the slogan, all power to the Soviets, was so important, because it meant completely brushing aside, getting rid of, dismantling the old state, and replacing it with a state that was run by the, uh, the um, uh, was run by the, uh, was, was, was run by the workers' councils, and, uh, 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 and of course he'd never got to completely finish uh, the writing of the State and Revolution properly, because as he said in his postscript to um, the first edition, this pamphlet was written in August and September 1917. I'd already drawn up the plan for the next chapter, which was going to be called The Experience of the Russian Revolution, um, but he says, I was interrupted by a political crisis, the eve of the October Revolution of 1917. Such an, such an interruption can only be welcomed. Uh, it's more pleasant and useful to go through the experience of the revolution than to write about it. And so, you know, from there he was then saying, OK, we've got these workers' councils. Sorry, guys, I can't write about it anymore. We've got to go and actually do this and organise the, um, um, the October Revolution. And one of the things that he really talks about uh, throughout it is about how... 
Um, it's opening up a period of creativity by which all workers will be able to participate in the um, organs of government. But it's very clear that it is still an instrument of class rule. That just as the state under capitalism is an instrument of class rule by the of the majority in the interests of the minority, that actually the democratic dictatorship of the proletariat is an instrument of class rule, but this time it's a class rule of the, uh, 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 by the majority against the minority. In other words, we have to continue to oppress and to keep down the bourgeois counter uh, the, 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 the bourgeois counter revolution. Don't expect they're all just going to crumble. They're all just just going to go off and cry under their beds and disappear. Oh no, we lost. No, they're going to go and organise. They're going to come back for you. We've got to be prepared for that, and we've got to think about how do we begin to organise society when workers haven't really gone through that whole process of how do we change ourselves and how do we how how can we organise society better and so on? And therefore the state continues to be a weapon of class rule, but it becomes a class rule for us against... Um, but it's a, 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 um, a class rule for us uh, against, um, uh, against them. Uh, he says, alongside an immense expansion of democracy, which for the first time becomes democracy for the poor, democracy for the people, and not democracy for the money bags. I love that, democracy for the money bags. The dictatorship of the proletariat brings about a series of restrictions on the freedom of the oppressors, the exploiters, and the capitalists. Um, he says, we must suppress them in order to free humanity from wage slavery. Their resistance must be crushed by, uh, uh, their resistance must be crushed by force. And it's clear that that is part of the transition uh, uh, the, tr the part of the transition to socialism. But he does go on to say that the more that democracy exists within society, real democracy, the less you begin to need the, um, uh, the, 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 the state and the more the state withers away. I'm going to skip the quotes about him talking about the state withering away because I'm kind of running, about running out of time, but uh, um, perhaps other people can, um, um, can fill that in because I just want to finish on two points, really. I want to talk about... Um, a little bit about how relevant that is for today um, and a little bit about what that means for the party because it's clear today, isn't it, that the state really is an instrument of class rule. That the, all that whole layer of army generals, cabinet ministers, judges, bankers, uh, uh, owners of big industry and so on really are, they really are in it together against us. They go to the same public schools, they're all related to each other, they marry each other. They're, I don't know if people saw the other day the thing about t apparently Tony Blair is going to be the godfather to Rupert Murdoch's daughter. You know, come on. You know, this is, a, you know, you look at these connections and this is, the, the, the state really is. Uh, 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 an instrument of class rule. And again, if you look at the question of Greece, you know, this is where the question is being posed most sharply, isn't it? About why is the Syriza government not able to, uh, uh, to stand up to the uh, European, uh, European Central Bank? And again, that whole process that by the, that, uh, of the way in which as they, as they don't stand up and as people start to realise that there's something wrong and start to come out on strike, go on demonstrations, start to radicalise, although they haven't broken with the idea that the state can still be used in some way, but they are starting to question it, and they are starting to fight back on a big scale that actually the repression in increases. So you get the, you know, you get the army being sent in by the Syriza government to um, attack immigrant camps. You get the army being sent in by the Syriza government to break up, um, to break up um, demonstrations, and of course you've also got the tie-up between the police and Golden Dawn within that, although thanks to um, mass movements from below that have been organised by um, socialists and so on within Golden Dawn, they are able to win some of that back. So that pressure is always going on there, and you can also see the way that ties up with the banks, in the way that, you know, through the financial pressure exerted on Greece, that that has, that has put the government under pressure to... Um, uh, uh, um, um, to, 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 to conform. So you continue to see the role that the state plays in that way happening um, today. I just want to finish, really, with um, what, the, what the lessons are f in terms of the party. Because in any situation of deep crisis, workers will fight. And to be honest, that is regardless of whether any kind of party is there or not. That is the nature of going right back to the beginning of what I quoted from Marx and Engels, the irreconcilability of the classes. All right? There will be class struggle. 
there will be crises, and sometimes that class struggle will be very, very sharp. But people will go into that struggle with all sorts of contradictory ideas inside their head. You know, look at Egypt. You can be in the square feeling your power, but then you can say the army is the friend of the people. You know, you can go into it with all sorts of confused ideas. And what reformist parties are completely unable to do is to challenge those ideas, because challenging those ideas means challenging the state, challenging the type of state that exists in society, and how we're going to um, and how we're going to uh, and, and talk about how we're going to um, organise uh, organise society differently. And therefore, you find leaders of reformist organisations. Uh, uh, um, failing in one way or another if that is the only alternative on the agenda. So in the situation of Greece, it might be the question of completely um, giving in, backstabbing, betraying the working class, whatever, right? Or that, that is obviously an ongoing battle that's still going on. But, or you can even see the, the bravest of the brave reformist leaders who really don't want to go back on their principles, who really don't want to give in but are incapable of mobilising the forces that are going to be needed, of arming the working class, replacing the standing army by the army of the working class, posing the army of the working class to the, to the, um, to the standing army and so on, incapable of doing that. Look at the example of Chile in 1973. Look at what happened to Allende. Right? So Allende was a very, 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 very left-wing, uh, led a very, very left-wing government. All right? And he said to the working class, don't worry, I'll, I, I, I can control the generals, I can get them on my side, it's okay, we don't want to antagonise them, right? Well, the workers were going, look what's happening, look what's happening, they're going to come for us, we want armours, you know, we want to be ready to fight. And there was a lack of leadership in mobilising our side to fight effectively. And the result was, you know, not only, uh, 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 not only um, I end his death, but actually following that, a massive period of reaction, uh, hundreds of thousands of people round up in places like Santiago Football um, Stadium and shot. And that is the price that we pay. If we, because workers will fight whether we say it or not, and they will fight with all these ideas in their head. And the price that we pay if we don't beforehand build on clear revolutionary principles that we aren't prepared to compromise on, we aren't prepared to work with anybody who doesn't agree with all our ideas, but we are not prepared to compromise on our ideas, and we are not prepared to compromise on the, on the fact that at the end of the day, if you want to really smash, society, uh, smash the bourgeois society, if you want to really create a fuller democracy, if you want to really stop reaction, then you have to be prepared to say the organs of the working class have to take state power and, uh, and smash the old state. And when that party needs to be built now, not at the moment when the crisis actually becomes apparent to you. Okay, we're going to open up uh, the discussion now. We've got plenty of time for contributions. Um, if people have questions, please uh, feel free um, to, to ask them. Yeah, basically you talk about the state and you know, it, was a, it was a good critique on it. Uh, the thing that you left out for me, and I think is very important, you know, you're talking about smashing the state, you have to first of all talk about private property because the first right you get under the state is your right of disposal over your own property. So that also gives me the right of exclusion from people to my property. And that is what the state protects. Now, until that changes, you know, the state <coughs> manages that. The state works within that. And if you have a society based on private property, the rules of private property, you're always going to have antagonisms. And you didn't mention that, so I'd like okay. to do Sorry, just a quick one. I was only halfway through um, writing it. I think that <coughs> Sue's right when she talks about, um, and Lenin was right when he <laughs> talked <laughs> when he talked about um, you know the idea of the state being used as a what was it? I think a, a snare, like a trap. Um, the idea that you can uh, change society through the state, or even bring about socialism through the state. I think um, it's important, especially now in Britain and actually across Europe to understand it in the context as well um, of, of why that snare is so uh, alluring 
um, is because of, um, I think we have to look at, you know, Keynesianism and the post-World War II um, era with, you know, the New Deal and stuff, um, because you did get, um, you know, Labour governments and uh, uh, reformist uh, governments uh, elected in different countries, and we did see huge changes for people in terms of the NHS, council housing, many, many of the public services that we use and rely on today. And I think that's why it's also important to have an understanding. Obviously, you know, <coughs> I hope people aren't just coming to this one meeting. It's important to get around an understanding um, of the fact that that was not really to do with which government was in power. Which government was in power was more symptomatic, really, of what was going on in wider society. Um, if you look actually back to like uh, election posters for like Labour and Tories back in like 1950s and 1960s and stuff like that, they'd actually compete with each other. Like Tory election posters would say like Labour haven't built enough council houses and we're going to build more. I mean, like this is the Tory party. Like it seems quite mad um, to imagine that now. And it was actually because <coughs> the ruling class um, was one uh, to basically uh, an idea, um, a, a strategy of overcoming the huge. Um, falls in profit rates that they'd had before the Second World War, um, that you could do that through Keynesianism, basically, through uh, spending more money, uh, uh, having a state that spent more money on public services so that those workers would then uh, buy, more, uh, buy, buy more products and stuff, and that would, um, that would boost profit. So I think that that's, you know, coming out of that period, um, we've seen neoliberalism and stuff like, uh, uh, you know, which has actually happened regardless of which government's in power, because that's about you know, that is now the strategy that the ruling class is wanting, the idea that actually we need to, um, we need to drive down uh, uh, spending uh, to, increase product, uh, to, in to increase profit, sorry. Um, and I think that, uh, I think that, um, but I think that that's why it still holds um, a lot of sway and why it's still alluring for a, a lot of people and why it's particularly important to learn from history. And obviously, um, you know, we need, to, we need to point that out to people who do think that, you know, it's possible, for example, for... Jeremy Corbyn, no, I back Jeremy Corbyn 100%, let me make that clear, but for people who think that Jer get, getting Jeremy Corbyn into Parliament is going to be you know, the be-all and end-all, that is frankly very, very wrong, and actually that will be when the real struggle starts, to be honest. So I think, um, you know, and I'll just end with the quote, you know, we're not uh, a socialist, people probably know um, the Socialist Workers' Party actually sometimes, well we think it's uh, appropriate, we do stand people for, for elections and stuff, but our attitude um, to it is that um, you know, we do it to actually raise the profile of the campaigns that we're involved in. I think Lenin said the quote, uh, Parliament is um, a pile of shit, or I think he used the word dung, dung heap. <laughs> Parliament, is a dung, Parliament is a dung heap. You can stand on top of the dung, uh, dung heap to project your voice further, but don't fall into it. And that's, that's, that's our approach to it. So, yeah, thank you. Uh, the next speaker will be followed by uh, the guy here in the white t shirt. Yeah. I mean, one of the, the, the important thing about the state and revolution is it posits a goal that we aim for. And that, 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 is, that was really important when Lenin wrote it, the height of the revolution. Um, and it's very important for us today, I think, as well. Because um, Le Lenin has to write it um, after a decades of reformists within the German Social Democratic Party, extremely respected figures. There's a guy called Kautsky who was called the Pope of Marxism. Um, he, he write, um, it, it, the, the, the orthodoxy was, yeah, we'll talk about the red flag, we'll talk about workers' power, but what we're actually really talking about is electoral politics, that the SPD will get more and more um, uh, uh, you know, uh, candidates, uh, MPs in the Reichstag, that we will uh, pass better laws for, for people, and eventually we'll morph into a, a more uh, a caring and uh, a socialist society. And it went beyond that, actually. There's a guy called Hilferding, uh, uh, key figure within SPD, who says, who said the final goal of communism, whatever that is, doesn't interest me at all. The movement is everything. In other words, we, we will never get to that final goal. And actually, Tony Benn, at Marxism's, uh, in, in the past, actually revived this idea. He said that so we'll never get to communism. Communism is not a train. Um, uh, it's not a destination that we'll get to on a train driven by Bob Crow. I remember was when, when one of his classic things. In other words, we'll never really get there. The movement is everything, and, and, and that's well, that's where that's where we're we're, 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 we're tempted. My boss, I, I worked for what used to be the Communist Party's distribution arm. My boss joined when he was a Maoist in the 60s, and then became a, a Stalinist. He said to me the other day, I don't really think even Marx wanted to get rid of capitalism, did he? <laughs> I don't know, there's, there's fucking 33 volumes of his work. Tell me where he said he wanted to preserve it. In other words, <laughs> this is really, 
really important because the, the, the vision that we have to put before people is that we can have a better society, but it's not going to be like the one we've got now. In fact, we have to smash the one we've got now to actually get there. And I'm sorry, Comrade, when you talk about the state of property relations, come on. There are a thousand people in this country that own £575 billion pounds between them. I live in Hackney where 40% of children live in poverty. The state is there to stop us strangling those bastards. And that's what we've got to do. After the, after the speaker will be the comrade at the back in the grey t-shirt. Uh, Sue so urged us all to read The State and Revolution. I actually think Margaret Thatcher read State and Revolution <laughs> because actually if you think that you know, the biggest challenge to the British state and, and, the, and the British bourgeoisie, certainly in my lifetime, was the miners' strike. Mm. And actually, you know, Lenin said the state is the product of irreconcilable class differences. The enemy within was the phrase that she used. Mm -hmm. The state is fundamentally armed bodies of men, prisons, etc. That is very important to just expand on that a little bit. Uh, you know, when, when we talk about the state in everyday language, you know, people might think, oh, it's the NHS. You mm -hmm. know, the, the school down the road is a state school and so on. Mm -hmm. Lenin is saying, yeah, 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 but actually its essence is armed bodies of men, prisons, etc. In other words, if the bourgeoisie fails to fix our heads through the sun of the Daily Mail, then actually they will break your head with a police truncheon or the troops on the streets. Mm -hmm. And actually, what was the miners' strike? At the end of the day, the miners' strike was coppers, armies of coppers being paid over time to get pickets uh, to stop pickets uh, you know getting to where they need to get to and so on it was an army operation you know Billy Elliot you know when they chased through the pit villages you know it's a bloody police state in you know in many many senses so I think I think Lenin and uh, writing State and Revolution in 1917 you know the miners strike it absolutely makes sense the second thing I want to talk about is the Soviets because you know Sue quite rightly talked about Lenin, the Russian Revolution, Lenin just wanted to be a dictator as the dominant narrative and so on. What is absolutely astonishing about most of the stuff that you read about the Russian Revolution is the way that most bourgeois historians, they write out of the thing mm. almost entirely, or some of the more honest ones in a sort of fairly sort of devious way, they write out the Soviets. Mm. And the reason why is because the Soviets are the, de the super democratic alternative to the parliamentary sham. And the reason why that is so, if you think about it like this, right? You know, most of us will spend most of our lives at work where there is no democracy at all. And then every five years you get to elect people to a parliament. In other words, the bourgeoisie rules by separating economics and politics, separating the life of work from this politics thing over here. The Soviets, just a Russian word meaning workers' council, it means that you actually have workers in their own workplaces electing delegates, and in the way that Sue talked about, immediately recallable, not, not on any more than the average workers pay. It's not a system like we have under parliamentary democracy where you know you have one MP tries to represent 70,000 atomized individual citizen constituents, right? That actually serves to help the bourgeoisie rulers in, in, you know, in, in a sham way. The Soviets fuse economic and politics. They're rooted in the workplaces. And actually, you know, the Bolshevik uh, revolution wasn't a coup. They actually won a majority of delegates in the Second Congress, or Russian uh, Congress of Soviets, of workers' deputies, peasants' deputies, soldiers' deputies. It was a real grassroots democracy. Today, people would use a word like people power. Right? And that's actually the power that Lenin is talking about in the State and Revolution, but that, that, that can't actually ever get to any kind of victory unless you break the old state machine, unless you break the armed bodies of, pren, um, armed bodies of men, prisons, etc. And that's what you have to do. And then you're on the road to actually a real, deep, genuine workers' democracy that's far superior to anything that the bourgeoisie are offering us. Next speaker, followed by um, Gary Black. Yeah, I'd like to respond to the comrade who asked initially about why don't we talk more about private property? Because it, it's a valid point. Because if what you mean by private property is capitalist control over the means of production, of course that's absolutely what we want to end. We want a world in which workers democratically uh, control production from below. So that's absolutely what we're about. Uh, the difficulty with that, though, is that. 
Uh, Karl Kautsky, the great reformist leader, could also say that's what he wanted to see uh, in his polemic with Lenin. The difference between the two people is that Kautsky argues we achieve this goal for a gradual erosion of state power and by capturing uh, the state, the state um, machine for ourselves uh, through elections and so on and so forth. What Lenin is arguing is that path is a dead end. What we have to do in a revolutionary situation <coughs> is we have to confront and break the power of the capitalist state. Why do we have to do this? Because in a revolutionary situation, the state becomes the key central organizing force of the ruling class. It's where the class, the ruling class's power is concentrated. And you see that all the time. Look at the situation in Egypt. How did the Egyptian ruling class, faced with a massive rebellion from below, organize the counter-revolution? They did it through the state. The state machine was absolutely critical, both as a repressive apparatus <coughs> And as the organizer for the capitalist class, when no one else could organize the capitalist class, stepping in, diverting that revolutionary process, holding it back, and then breaking it. And today, what that means in practice is the state uh, seizing revolutionaries and throwing them in prison, breaking their will to resist, and so on and so forth. Uh, the state is the key uh, tool that the ruling class uses in those situations. And that's why Lenin insists that you have to break the, uh, break the capitalist state prior to reorganizing the economy. And it's very different to the great French Revolution, the great bourgeois revolutions that established capitalism. In those revolutions, the capitalists can establish their economic power before they actually have to take state power. Socialist revolution is different. We have to first smash the capitalist state, and then we can talk about a process of reorganizing the economy under democratic lines and beginning to build a communist, uh, a, a, with a small c, a socialist or communist society. Final point is this. If we have to smash the state, how do we go about it? And this is absolutely critical to Lenin's argument, because uh, Lenin doesn't argue that the kind of society we want to build is modelled on the SWP. I, mean, I love the SWP. I don't want to live in a society that looks like the SWP. <laughs> um, the motive force of revolutionary change is a mass movement by billions of working class people. The organs of workers' self-rule that are thrown up in a revolution. That's what paves the way to a new society. However, you cannot draw that energy, creativity, and power together unless you have a tool forged by workers that can draw those struggles together, centralize them, and direct them at the ruling class and direct them at the state. And that, for Lenin, is a key role of the Revolutionary Party and why we take seriously the job of building organizations like the SWP today. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker will be followed by uh, Tom Rayther. Uh, yeah, I thought that like a lot of people were talking about reformism, and I just wanted to kind of add to that. And uh, at school in the moment, we're doing kind of the rise of Hitler. And mm. after World War One, when there was the the armistice and the Treaty of Versailles, a man called Ebert took control of Germany, and he was a social democrat, a kind of reformist at the time. And he <coughs> up a socialist republic, and they got rid of the Kaiser, and they set up loads of kind of public services. And it seemed like it was a kind of step in the right direction. And then the Spartacist League began to grow. And there was a Spartacist uprising in Berlin. And so they supported the right-wing ultra-nationalist Freikorps to crush the Spartacist kind of almost communist movement. And they killed Rosa Luxemburg. They killed Karl, Karl Liebknecht, who was said to be the German Lenin. And it shows you kind of the dangers of reformism. That yes, it can, it can work to some extent. But when it starts becoming the state and doing the things that the state did before, it's not the right thing. And in fact, they, they kind of learned that because once they supported the, the right wing as the Freikorps, the Freikorps then took control of Berlin and they had, to call, they had to flee to Weimar, hence the name Weimar Republic, and call an all-out uh, general strike to get rid of the Freikorps. And we're seeing kind of, I mean, not, not the same, obviously. It's not kind of murder and betrayal. But we're seeing similar things today, like Labour gets into power, they invade Iraq. Labour gets into power, they cut the NHS. But then you have the same with the Tories, they get into power, they invade countries, they invade the Falklands, they cut the NHS. It seems like everyone that we elect, no matter how left-wing or no matter how progressive they are, they're not going to do it because once they get in, there's pressures from either side, 
there's people saying they need to do this, they need to do this, they have to follow all the procedures, they have to, ultimately they have to get a majority in Parliament. And a majority of Parliament is not communist, is not socialist. It's people who have made a career out of politics and people who are going to want to further that career. Um, I want to say a quick little thing about the private property argument because I don't think it's been covered uh, properly yet. Um, I mean, when we talk about the taking of the smashing of the state and the taking over the private property for years and years and years, I'm sure people here have had that. It's a bit, they people say, "Well, you can't have my house, or you can't have my garden," and it's reduced down to their own individual bits of private property. And people say, "Well, you can't have a socialist revolution because you can't nationalise private property because it means we're going to lose our houses." It's not what it means at all. It means they're taking over the means of production. And then you, from that you talk about in terms of the nationalisation of the banks, the taking over of the financial institutions, but the, the, the essential thing is the taking over of the army and, or the, the expansion of the, uh, of the people's militia and the right of the, uh, and the, of the power to the Soviets and the organisation of the broad, of the very, very broad uh, democracy, and which is exactly at the heart and the core of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Lenin's writing. But the, the other thing, a point I want to make though, is about, I mean, Sue couldn't get to it, about the withering away. I think it's important, just for a short amount of time, not a big amount of history, so we've only got a, a small window of history to see it, but as soon as the dictatorship of the proletariat begins, it begins to wither away. And, and what do we mean by that? Because immediately you start extending these means of production, of uh, uh, democracy. It goes from the Putinov works in, uh, in say, in, in St. Petersburg to other factories in St. Petersburg. Then it goes to the factories and offices and workplaces in Moscow. Then it goes to Kiev. Then it goes to Odessa. Uh, as it spreads and spreads, there's more and more uh, communities and areas are taken under uh, the control of the people who live there. That They determine the route and the direction of what, of what is is going to go, then that 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 begins to uh, to generate uh, the decline of the dictatorship of the proletariat, and in other areas as well, in terms of fields of culture, fields of fit, uh, 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 art, uh, in terms of social uh, legislation, in terms of uh, women's right to uh, to instant divorce, the whole thing about the. Uh, uh, economic, not relying on the economic uh, of, your, of your husband, the, uh, the, the youth communes, the development of youth housing, all those things begin to break down the old order in a different kind of way. And that expansion, it lasted for four or five years until the crushing of the Russian Revolution. But for those four or five years, you could see the ways in which Lenin meant that the, uh, the dictatorship would wither away as more and more, as people got more and more control of their lives and the possibility of the counter-revolution became less and less. Uh, I just want to expand a bit more on the Weimar Republic. Uh, the Weimar Republic and uh, the SPD didn't last long in power. <laughs> they, they actually failed at completely by trying to uh, insert these socialist, these more democratic elements into the parliamentary democracy of the time. Uh, a major reason that was why the Weimar Republic was so inefficient was simply because um, they implemented, again, based on socialistic principles, a complete proportional representation. So that everyone had the right to be represented in the parliament, meaning that at one time you had five ruling parties, and that the democracy in the Weimar Republic completely collapsed when they couldn't really agree upon a 5% change in how much money should be spent on something I can't really remember right now. So together with that, of course, we have that the Weimar Republic, the SPD, um, not only allied itself with the old power structures, but kept the old power structure and infrastructure, the old uh, the state workers, the people, uh, the 
ministers who also served during the era of the Reich, during, during the time of the um, First World War. So that once uh, in the later state, stages of the Republic, um, people began to be disenfranchised with the mess that was the Weimar Republic, they tended to be, they tended not to the left as would be preferable, but rather to the right, to Hitler. And I wouldn't necessarily say that the failure of the Weimar Republic completely, should completely uh, um, turn us away from thinking that reformism is ever, inviolable, ever a viable option, because even if we don't like to admit it, if we were going by uh, past failures, socialism wouldn't really be the best option. But I still think that the Weimar Republic provides insight into how reformism can, can quickly derail into a failed state. Okay, we have time for one uh, more uh, quite brief uh, contribution, after which uh, we're uh, going to uh, bring the speaker back in. I'll be very brief comments. Um, the reason I came to this meeting today is because one of the first meetings I went to at Marxism yesterday, um, Charlie Kimber did about um, why Britain voted to leave the EU. And one of the questions that an audience member came and raised um, was why couldn't we just all join the EU and, and uh, find the good people in the European Parliament, <coughs> reform it and make it into a progressive body. And, and there was a voice in my head just going, state and revolution, state and revolution. <laughs> Go to the state and revolution meeting. I, I think this argument about mm. what the state is is really important and, and people should read state and revolution for that reason. I'll just cut that point. The other point I wanted to make was some of the arguments around the EU stuff about all of the experts say that if we leave the EU, it will be a disaster, blah, 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 blah. And the same stuff was said around Greece. All of the experts say that if Greece defaults on its debt, on its debt, Armageddon. So there's a great reason if all the experts are lining up to say this, that we need to think of what our politics say and, and what our um, historical materialism and, and uh, uh, politics through action says, and it's, it is that we need to smash the state and, and replace it with something else. So state and revolution, I'm glad it came. Thank you. Mm. Okay, thank you very much everyone uh, who's contributed. Just before uh, I bring Sue back in, um, just a, a couple of very brief uh, announcements. First of all, um, State and Revolution, which has been referred to uh, a lot in the meeting today, um, is available at uh, Bookmarks, um, the Socialist Bookshop, and it's available if you're interested in uh, have, doing a bit of further reading, you can um, come and buy it um, from me uh, just now if you, if you, if you want to. Um, and there's plenty more books on uh, Lenin and, um, uh, at, uh, at Bookmarks. Um, and uh, secondly, if you want to continue the discussion, if you have any questions about the meeting today, you can uh, go and speak to uh, these guys at the back with the red forms here if you, if you want to um, carry on the discussion uh, after the meeting. Um, okay, so. okay, thanks very much, comrades. Um, thanks for the points you've raised, and a lot of people have come back on them um, very well. So I'm not really going to repeat a lot of um, what people have said, but um, just to, I just want to start actually with a little quote um, from, um, I think this is from Engels, writing on the housing question, because again, when I talked about how relevant a lot of this stuff is for today, um, you know, and people talked about private poverty and what can be achieved and stuff like that, he says, um, one thing is certain, there's already a, 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 a sufficient quantity of houses in the big cities to remedy immediately any real housing shortage, inverted commas, provided they are used judiciously. This can naturally only occur through the expropriation of the present owners by quartering in their houses homeless workers or workers overcrowded in their present homes. I mean, you could just really translate that to today, couldn't you? And you could put it on a manifesto, really. You know, it's brilliant. Um, and But one of the points that, that, that they make is that that's not about private property. That's not about saying, we'll give you this home and this home is yours. It's about saying, because because we control it now. This now becomes the property of our state and therefore 
um, uh, uh, you know, and, uh, 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 and therefore we will decide to give it to you. And therefore the important point is, how do you get to that position where you control the state and make those decisions? So the key question is the one of capturing control of the state. And it's the question that a lot of people don't like to say. They like to make all these nice um, demands and expressions and revolutionary, uh, uh, you know, revolutionary slogans, but they miss out completely the point of the state. In other words, how are you going to get yourself into this position where we as a working class make the decisions that matter um, make the decisions that uh, um, um, that matter in society. I mean, um, Paul Holborn is meeting on the Russian Revolution this morning. Talked about, and it's 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 described in um, John Reed's book, Ten Days That Shook the World, about how um, you know a taxi driver driving him in from the station into Petrograd, kind of you know went, look at this Petrograd. This is my Petrograd. You know, this real feeling that we now had some kind of of, of say in um, uh, uh, um, in in uh, in what in, in what happened. Uh, in, in, in what happened in society and how um, you know people rise up rise up to the that that challenge to how do you run society now that it is yours now that you feel that you've got a stake in society how are you going to rise up to that and start to take an active um, 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 an, a, a, an active part in, in that and how it becomes um, much more democratic than the parliamentary system you know people have looked uh, you know people have talked about how you know in under the current democracy we vote every few years for who's going to rule over us you know Lenin talked about this 100 years ago Lenin talked about this um, to decide once every few years which member of the ruling class is to repress and crush the people in parliament <laughs> such is the real essence of bourgeois parliamentarianism not only in parliamentary constitutional monarchies but also in the most democratic republics you know Lenin, Lenin said this 100 years ago that this is what we do that even in the most even in the most democratic republics all you're doing is voting to say who's going to rule over you and who's going to repress you for the next um for the next five years that's not to say that it doesn't make a difference it can make a difference you know why do we in that case why do we support corbyn why does it matter because the process by which you argue within the parliamentary arena can actually have a have an effect on people's confidence can either can you know can make them expect more and want more and demand more or it can make them think that nothing's really possible and therefore it does matter that we intervene in the parliamentary arena we shouldn't just we, uh, uh, we shouldn't just leave it but we should understand that there is a better type of democracy available to us that that workers councils are a higher form of democracy than parliamentary democracy and one of the things that Lenin describes I couldn't quite find the quotes in there just now but he describes the way in which not not only is it about voting once every five years for who's going to oppress you but it also operates in such a way that the vast majority of ordinary people are excluded from that process don't have real access to it either through lack of time through lack of proper education through all sorts of things it, it in inevitably becomes something that is just for the elite and by the elite and it excludes a lot of ordinary workers look at the people who end up sitting in parliament you know it's you know so 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 whereas a workers council where people are directly elected from workers in a particular area you know you you if you elect a, if you elect your candidate what was the last by election we had tutin or something you know well when do the people of tutin ever meet together to discuss how their mp's going when do all of the people of tutin get together and go what do you think about what i did oh, I'm not too sure about that. Let's have a discussion. Now, but in your workplace, you're together all the time, aren't you? You're always going, oh, this is what the boss did the other day. This is what blah, blah, you know. And therefore, it, it immediately becomes much more democratic because you're in direct contact all the time with the people who are representing you. So organising yourself on the basis of workplaces, of housing estates, of things like this, is actually a much more fundamentally democratic way of operating than the sham democracy that we have um, 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 that we have at the moment, and I think that's, um, um, you know, and I think that's really, um, and I think, and I, and I think that's really important. You know, the examples that people have, have, have given about the viciousness of the state when it feels threatens, and you know, the way that we saw it in the miners' strike and so on, is absolutely valid. Because if we're going to say to people, well, we actually want to get rid of this state, and we're going to replace it with a completely different kind of state, and we're going to get rid of the standing army, and we're going to replace it with workers, uh, uh, with with, 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 with bodies of armed workers that maybe rotate so we all get a go, you know, and we all get a go in the organs of office. We don't we don't elect 
elect people for life, that we want to bring more and more people into participating into that into that democracy. Now, how do we? How, how do we? You know, they, they are going to fight us. They are going to fight us with the brute force aspect of the government, with the armed bodies of men, with the prisons, prisons, with the torturers, and so on. You have to be prepared to organise on a, on the basis of saying that you are going to stand up. Now, the only way you can break that actually is through mass action. Now, it doesn't mean that we need. You know, it's not that we're going to organise a little army and go out and fight their army. We need mass action on the streets. And one of the things, of course, that mass action can do is to start to break armies. You know, to force the army to shoot on their brothers and sisters and representatives of the community and so on. You know, you can see that people start to break in those sorts of moments of mass crisis. But uh, you know, but only when the masses really come out on the streets. So the precondition of raising the slogan "All Power to the Soviets." It wasn't the slogan all the way through. The precondition of raising that slogan was that the mass movement had reached that point where, actually, and this would kind of be, you know, famously known perhaps that on the eve, on the on the day of the actual insurrection itself, less people died than in making the film of the insurrection um, that, that that was made. Why? Because by that stage, actually, the argument had been won by the Bolsheviks in the Soviets throughout all of the uh, major. Uh, workplaces, factories, army regiments, and so on, um, throughout um, Petrograd. So, uh, you know, so 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 the key is arming us theoretically, but also engaging with people in a way that starts to win over masses in the real battle of the day to day, in the real battle of the day to day um, struggles that take place now. And I just want to go back to the, you know, the question of Germany is really vital because actually, what one of the things that Lenin and the Bolsheviks said was that our revolution will not survive on its own. If we are, if we are left to survive on our own, we are defeated. That our, that, that, that our internet, our, 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 the success of our revolution depends on it becoming an international revolution. And this wasn't pie in the sky talk at the time. You know, you look at Germany, at Austria, at Hungary, at a whole number of countries where workers Soviets were being set up, where people were starting to look at what was happening in Russia, where people were angry about what was happening with the war, uh, and so on and so forth. There was a real revolutionary ferment going on across large swathes of Europe. The idea of an international workers revolution was not an abstract question. This was being posed concretely in a whole um, number of number of places. Inside Germany, the German working class who had been led for many, many years by the Socialist, uh, the Social Democratic Party, which betrayed them by supporting the, um, 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 the First World War, actually the question of what alternative party you need as, it went, as they went into 1917, 1918 and so on, became absolutely crucial. And, and, and somebody mentioned Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht and actually that decision to break with the Social Democratic Party and form an independent uh, revolutionary party was left too late. It was left too late and therefore when the question came of how you are going to take on the state which was, you know, somebody said it actually was, you know, what was the um, social democratic gov uh, um, uh, um, government working hand in glove with the fry car, with the, with the, with the um, uh, 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 you know, forerunner, uh, the, the, what went on to become uh, the core of the Nazi party and so on. That, uh, 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 that when, 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 when the core question was posed of how you're going to stand up to the state, they were unable to mobilise the masses on their side. This isn't a question of being heroic and of saying, yeah, we're for smashing the state, we're going to come out and chuck a few bombs at you. You have to mobilise the masses on your side. And you cannot do that if you have not systematically, over a period of time, begun to win the most active, the vanguard workers to your side, the most militant ones, the most, the ones who most want to tear the system's head off, the ones with the best experience of taking on the bosses, the mouthy, the gobby people, all of those people, we need to get them organised on our side now. The people who understand that when you fight, you've got to try and win people and take people with you. We need to organise them with us now and if we do that now then we can talk about seriously uh, as the crisis develops and as you know as, as people start to look for alternative forms of, of organization and, and, and ways to fight back and ways to win we can win them to our side but we're not going to leave that till the middle of the government and end up like Rosa Luxemburg getting battered with a rifle button, button chucked in the river we are starting to build that organization now so please join us if you haven't done so already thank you